let me just say, um, when you called me, it's like, uh, you know, definitely I was, you know, very humbled and appreciative. But to actually be here, I think, is starting to really, you know, kind of hit me in terms of the, the magnitude of taking a part in this special, rare, um, what you put together, which is really unprecedented because hopefully more families, you know, will, you know, document their family's legacy and more importantly, their mom and dad and the impact yes. in addition to going to Ancestry.com, looking at your legacy and your history, you've kind of blazed a new path, you know, yes. that, you know, your daughters are here. And so generationally, uh, from a generational standpoint, you can say, hey, my daughters and they get married, they have kids and grandkids and great grandkids to be able to let them know and let them see for themselves, you know, where they come from and the legacy and the foundation that was laid and they are who they are because of two magnificent people, you know, blaze and new trails. So, you know, um, you could have called a lot of people, mm. but I knew maybe there was something in you would say, no, I think I need to call Kevin, yeah. you know, Kevin Butts, because obviously I grew up down the street. So I, I appreciate it, Mark. We moved in in December of 1967. At that time, I was three years old. Uh, but as I became older, four or five, I remember uh, pretty vividly because I was able, by that time I rode my bike, so I was able to ride up and down the street of the neighborhood. And although I remember the house being there, the significance to me was the block itself. Because during that time on Beachwood, it was a lot of neighbors uh, down the street, across the street. And um, I would ride my bike, and I got to know a lot of the neighbors on the, on the block. I mean, a little personally for a little boy. Mm -hmm. There was another young, young boy that I played with. And then, so that was one of the vivid memories that I have of the uh, house itself. And of course, it was across the street from the community center. So that brought in an influx of people from all over the neighborhood, too. Um, and with the house itself, it was being that young, you realize it's a little different, but with our parents also, you know, the way they brought us up, it was just a humbling experience. Of course, I was still a child. Mm -hmm. So you was just, I was just another, uh, another kid on the block. You oh, know, man. no better, no worse than nobody else. By the time I was five, um, that's what I remember recalling that first Christmas okay. because we had the living room up front. We had a big tree up front. Of course, all I got a drum set. It was all in the front room. So that was one of the things I remember. So this is maybe two years later. Two years later. And uh, like I said, at that time, at five-year-old, you're still a child. So you know it's a significance there. But in the same token, it's, uh, you know, like I said, I was just another child on the block. So... It wasn't no that you know you feel better or worse than somebody else, but um, I would say a five year old I definitely remember uh, more so growing up there at the time. You know, mom in particular, she would always decorate the entire house. I remember even fruit bowls. If you remember when they had fruit bowls and nuts and stuff, she put out everything for Christmas um, to make sure that it was special to us. Um, so I always remember the trees and the decorations. Also, you know, I remember just we would get a ton of Christmas cards from all over, especially since Dad was a politician. People from all over the state and probably further than that would um, give us Christmas cards and she would have them all over like the uh, trim, the walls a little bit, you know, um, leading into some of the rooms. So it was just always a happy time. We spent time with family. We pop called. So that's, those were my earliest memories. I remember receiving a lot of people. Well, my parents did. Our house was pretty much open to the community. Mm -hmm. At this time, it's 68, 69, almost 1970. And uh, from what my parents told me, I mean, we had people literally from all over Detroit come knock on our door. And it wasn't like a mass dream. But every now and then, you know, somebody would come by. Hey, we admire your house. Can we take a tour? My parents were open like that. Sure, we could take a tour. 
they may ask some questions. Well, how you guys built this? At the time, you know, they was a young couple, mid to uh, late twenties when they completed the home mm -hmm. in 1967. So um, it was very significant. A lot of black people, even white people came. On Saturdays, I remember people knocking on the door, generally men in the community, you know, they would come and knock on the door, ask for daddy, um, and dad would take time out on his Saturday mornings um, to stand, you know, around and talk to them, and just to talk about whatever they were chatting about, um, but usually they would be there for like a couple hours talking to dad, um, so we shared our parents, um, my mom was had so many like gowns and dresses because they had to go to community events um, related to you know my father's position so um, we shared our parents um, and that was okay it was a blessing um, and I think that's the legacy that they uh, left today. At this time this when uh, the suburbs were opening up to black people or starting to gradually open up. And a lot of the white folks, 67, 68, 69, by that time, if they weren't in the suburbs already, a lot of them were going that way. Right. So they were looking for new ways to build a home, um, you know, do it efficiently and effectively and still have a nice uh, house itself. And the thing about that house, too, um, my father called it, it was a California split level. It was mm -hmm. a California-style house. Mm -hmm. As you know, in Detroit, you got a lot of Tudors, you got Colonials, right. you have the Revival model. So it was kind of like a, a contemporary or a fresh ideal of a house you didn't really see typically, particularly in River Rouge. That's the beautiful thing about growing up in River Rouge, and more importantly, uh, the Tuckers, you know, laying that foundation for Mark and his sister. And then for us, as young men, some of us, a lot of us knew who our father was, spent time with him. Well, there were many of us where the father was not in the home. So to see an example of a couple, a young couple, stuck together, raised their kids. So also as young men, African-American men, we got a chance to see a gentleman and a man and how he reflected in terms of how he raised his family and the foundation that he laid. So as a young man, you can see an example. So you gotta have a balanced perspective and not just say, because in real I say the good, the bad, and the ugly, but the good was 95%. Yes. You know, in addition to that, you can only be what you see. Mm -hmm. So a lot of young African-American men, we had a chance to see growing up, a man, Mr. Tucker, on the school board, had an amazing career, mother, class, style, dignity, the way she carried herself and the way she raised her daughter, you know, to be respectful, classy, and not kind of running all over the place. So I think, you know, the impact of the home, but I think also the impact of the Tuckers also was that what they represented for those young men and women who maybe didn't get a chance to see and experience what your sister experienced, but we got a chance to see that was possible. Yeah, it can happen. Yeah, it can possible. happen. And now you always say, one day, and we probably get to it, one day I'm going to have a house like that. That's what I forgot to say. You know, as, as a kid, you'd be like, you would look, you'd be like, okay. But you could see it one day. So it gave us something to aspire to. Oh. So I thank your mom and dad, you know, for that. Some of the reasons why I think they built when they were, obviously they got married at 62. Mm -hmm. So they rented homes. They rented a home in southwest Detroit on Lindisdale. And then when I was born, they had a home on Campbell Street. Okay. They was renters. And I think at the time, they just wanted to, uh, you know, build and stop, you know, not be a renter for all their lives. I think their mindset was just, hey, we're going to strive and build us a nice home in the community. Um, of course, they both grew up. My brother is from Ecorse. My father's from River Rouge. Of course, they got married, so they have roots out here, so they knew have a lot of family here, mm -hmm. have a lot of uh, community connections here. So I think that was a desire. Remember my parents telling me that they were looking at different locations, you know, throughout Southwest Detroit, uh, River Rouge, Ecorse, and that spot uh, stood the same. And uh, I was just recently looking at some paperwork, and uh, some of the names that I came up with was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Clarence and Ethel Bates. They were uh, persons who owned the land, mm -hmm. and they were one of the uh, persons who my parents bought the land from them, and they gave them the deed. 
And uh, speaking of that, the actual owner of this building here we're speaking in, mm -hmm. that those were her grandparents. Oh, and uh, right. they also had roots in River Rouge in this area also. Right. So I think that connection of having black people um, here uh, with already who own or landowners. Uh, if you look at the area and just Detroit in general, a lot of people built their own homes from cinder block homes to uh, magnificent homes. So we weren't the first uh, black home builders in the area uh, by far. Well, uh, it was a lot of people who had that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot of people who were already, you know, made brick masons, were already carpenters and construction who had wow. the skills. So once they learned that my parents wanted to build, I think they all collaborated and they uh, subcontracted their, their services. During that time, during the 60s, uh, when they built the home, it was, a, I guess, a great milestone and also inspirational too, because a lot of the homes in Rouge and Ecorse, like my mother told me, that there were still Quonset huts off Palmerston and all that area. So once they built, in the 60s, by the 70s, early 70s, early 80s, a lot of people started building homes in Ecorse and River Rouge, and they always looked to the Tucker home as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. As a friend gave an example earlier, people would say, oh, if they did it, we can do it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true. Mm -hmm. um, they could see that they had a physical sense. They was able to see and touch it and talk to people who had been there and done it. Like I said, uh, it's not that we were felt better or any significant. We were just always, I was just another kid on the block. Also during the late 60s, you had people, um, the neighborhoods you couldn't uh, go to at the time. Uh, I think that changed over the early 70s and we were able to um, open up and people started to have the freedom to build and move, um, build and move to other places also. So that was a, a great thing. During my elementary years, when I was younger, people would always ask, do you all have an elevator now? Don't you guys have an elevator? <laughs> and I'm like, no, we know. I take the stairs um, and go upstairs. What impressed me the most is that um, here you have a young couple in their mid-20s, um, African-American couple, and I usually say black couple because that's the way they were perceived back in the 1960s when they built the house. Um, a young black couple in their mid-20s who decided to take on this endeavor to build a home from the ground up. That was phenomenal. Um, a lot of people don't even realize that my parents did not finance that house. They paid for it as they built it. So I remember mom telling us that when the ground was laid, when they dug the basement and the foundation that was built, they paid for that. So as they layered the house and built the house, they um, paid for it. Um, and so that was phenomenal for a young black couple yes. in their 20s yes. in the 1960s. Um, and if you see pictures of the home, you may say, well, it's not too big. Yes, there are a lot of houses now that are the size of our home and even bigger, but the quality of materials that they use to build that home, you don't find in today's construction. Um, redwood, the whole house, the entire house brick. Most of the time, new houses, the facade is just is in the front. The brick is in the front, maybe a little on the side. Um, marble. Um, window seals, um, porcelain tile that I remember the gentleman coming to um, when they had the, one of the bathrooms remodeled, the gentleman came and actually laid each individual tile. So it wasn't a sheet tile. That's craftsmanship that you couldn't get um, in a lot of the homes today. Um, woodwork beautiful hardwood, um, pocket doors. Those are details that were phenomenal. And actually, my understanding is that Dad helped design the part of the front facade of the home as well. So, ingenious. Like she said before, you know, some people, if they're blessed and fortunate to accomplish certain things, you know, sometimes more important, their kids sometimes can be a little, you know, snobbish, a little arrogant, you know, you can't tell them nothing. But I think the foundation, um, the Tuckers, I mean, they're phenomenal. When you see beautiful, wonderful people, I'm always that it's a reflection of, number one, their parents and their upbringing. Where's the foundation laid? So it was refreshing that here we have friends that we grew up with. And I mean, let's be real. 
not everybody grew up in a custom-made house built from the ground, and you would walk and look and be like, wow, I wish I could live in a house like that. Maybe one day I can have a house like that. So also it gave you something to look at, to aspire to, and then to top it off, the children, Mark and his sister, were very humble. Didn't have an ego. Come on over. It's cool. So what, you know, Mark, we say what's wealth and knowledge and what have you if you don't share it? Don't be selfish with it. Exactly. Because you never know the impact it can have on others. So it was like an open door. And Mr. Tucker and Mrs. Tucker, you know, it was an open door. You can come. And, and it was a benefit for us to be able to um, be the neighborhood. The guys that grew up with you and your sister, it gave us an opportunity to be able to share in this um, wonderful home and unprecedented for a young couple to do what they did. And that had an impact on a, a lot of us. You could talk to many people in River Rouge during that time. And the first thing they would tell you, they would never forget that home or in Beachwood, but then more importantly, we got a chance to kind of brag. Like, well, my, my, friend, my, my friend lived right oh, there. Oh, yeah. You know, so you couldn't have, when we went to school, you walked down the street every time you look over there, you know, so it was, it's pretty special. We grew up in a city that um, we were very fortunate um, that the village, you know, we always hear that, it takes a village. Uh, but where we grew up, we can uh, attest to that and we can speak boldly about that because um, we, a lot of our parents came from the south and other areas of the United States and came to Michigan, as they say, up north for better opportunities. You know, so naturally from elementary school to, it was fascinating because, you know, now you go to school K through five and six and seven over here. And we went to school, we went to high school in eighth grade. Right, right. So we went to school K, we have folks that we grew up with, we've been knowing since K through 12. Exactly. So you're talking K through 12, I mean, and the closest people to you are normally your brother, sister, your first cousins. Mm -hmm. But where we grew up, you know, you go to school K through 12, you have an extended family of friends like, like cousins. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, so Mark and I, you know, we've been in the sister, you know, we've been on each other all our lives. And, and, that, and that's a blessing to say that it is. most folks, you, can you pinpoint a count on your fingers? Mm -hmm. How many friends do you still know to this day and you went to school together? But we can say K through 12, it does not get any better and closer than that. Do you know why the house was built on Beachwood? I thought it was uh, perfect. Uh -huh. <laughs> because of the community center was right across the street. And it, and it was kind of odd in, uh, in a way because it was high traffic Beachwood mm -hmm. at those times, you know, like most of the times if you try to get out of the rules, you'd be running down Beachwood. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. you know but, but, uh, but uh, he had the land, the space, and it did that neighborhood good. You know, I can jokingly say it was like a little baby Vegas strip in a positive way because yes, yeah. um, um, the house where Mark and grew up across the street was the Beachwood Center. So during that time, we had a community center. Exactly. So the whole, the, what we hear now today, well, kids won't have anywhere to go. They out running the streets, and there's not no supervision. We were blessed to have a community center where in the summertime, we played basketball, we played board games, we had tennis tournaments, we had a swimming pool. I mean, we had everything. And in the wintertime, we had arts and craft, we had ping pong, you can shoot pool. So you can go somewhere and be amongst your friends. Exactly. Um, there was supervision. Um, so it kept us occupied. Yeah. You know, we didn't have to worry about, you know, getting in trouble. We couldn't get in trouble because, you know, back in them days, our parents didn't play. Right. You know, but more importantly, so it attracted the entire, that, that center attracted everyone from the neighborhood and surrounding cities. Southwest Detroit, E-Course, because it was always something happening. So naturally, I was, you know, you know, joking with the sister. I say, nah, but when you came down that strip, that Main Street Beachwood, you couldn't help but look to your right and be like, who there right there? You know, who? If you, if you run from woods, I mean, we all knew, but yeah. whenever you rolled down that street, you couldn't help but be compelled and, you know, just it would catch your eye and be like, oh, my goodness, because not only was it, was it 
on the outside, you know, physically a beautiful home, but it had a unique design where it made you look, it made you, because it was the biggest house on the block. Mm. And it kind of stood out. And um, so you couldn't help but on Beachwood, outside of the beach, this is, a, this is really fascinating. I'm talking to a sister that outside of the Beachwood Center, the main attraction on that street was the Tucker's home. Yes. I mean, it stood out. And more important than that, you would look there before you looked at the center. So that was pretty magnificent that when you drove down that street, it couldn't help but catch your attention to say, wow. Uh, my mother was uh, very, she was very sweet. She was kind. She was a diligent person. Uh, she was also strong-willed. She was a great administrator. She always taught me that you got to take care, of, be organized, take care of your business, take care of your paperwork, have your things in order. She was great at that, doing those type of things. Mm -hmm. So she was very, um, very good at that. Very open and also sociable. Right. Maybe my personality, she doesn't, didn't talk a lot, but she was always open to people, you know, very open to people, stuff like that. She was uh, involved in uh, the community, not so much in a political sense, mm -hmm. but like I say, she was connected with a lot of people, had a lot of friends, and also by her working at uh, Samuel B. Milton, Sunby Memorial Hospital, she knew a lot of people from the community. Um, she worked in uh, billing and insurance and that administrative realm of it. So she had a lot of influence on that and on that part. Oh, and man. during the, I know during the 80s when uh, high school children would work there during the summer, you know, they always comment how, you know, my, nice my mother was, how she helped them out with a situation, you know, as far as just either maintaining a job or how to get into the, the hospital itself. Right. And uh, so that was pretty significant on her part. Mom and dad, um, did a phenomenal job um, ensuring that um, me and my brother Mark um, were raised um, to respect people and be kind. We embraced our community. Um, we were we played with the kids in the neighborhood. Um, we attended the school. Um, we actually attended church in the neighborhood. So that was important to mom and dad that um, we were, like I said, we were always kind to people um, and we just were humble. Um, and that went uh, resonated a long way with me. It, you know, they didn't have time for people being pretentious. They were not, they, you know, connected with the community well and they ensured that um, uh, I connected and my brother connected well with the uh, people in our neighborhood. I'm thankful. Um, that I'm where I am today um, in major part to what my parents did for um, myself and my brother. Um, I just, I thank God that they, you know, allowed us to be humble. I, I do a lot of corporate work, a lot of, you know, societal type things, um, and I'm glad at who I am in every encounter that I have with people. I thank God that I'm able to um, connect with people in a way that, um, is um, how we need in this world today. My father, who was also, he was a good person, uh, very uh, firm, he was no nonsense. The same token, he was a fair, he wasn't a, a totalitarian or a bully in a sense, right. but he expected the, you know, the best from us. You know, I wasn't the type of student, I didn't make all A's and B's, but he de definitely wanted me to do my best. If he felt I wasn't doing my best, then he would also check me on that too. So it's definitely to have a blessing to have parents there and uh, also to be able to um, experience that. Could you uh, describe what type of man was uh, Rudolph Tucker to you? Uh, to me, big brothers. You know, coming out of Alabama, as we did, you know, uh, we lived with Uncle Elijah and I moved it, you know, for a year or so. You know, so it was like big brother to carry it on the rest of my life because he used to come visit me at least you know once a month we'd have a little chit chat so it was always big brother to me mm -hmm. you know uh, and and that's the way i always felt about it he did too yeah he's a great guy right <laughs> i mean all the way around educated easy going mm -hmm. you know he didn't he didn't really uh 
make rain like that unless he had to. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't messed with. Right. <laughs> Quiet guy, but you know, he carried a big stick, you know. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> I remember the elementary school that I went to, Sabbath. Um, my father's name was on a plaque, a permanent plaque in the school. So to me, that struck me as when I was young, you know, it kind of struck me as, wow, my dad's name is in, in, on a plaque in the school that I attend. Um, there's something special about that. Um, and so that was always something that stood out to me. And now, of course, I know that's because at the time he was um, vice president of the school board uh, for the city um, when the school was built. So it's a permanent plaque. It's probably still there today. I think the first year he may have uh, ran for that was in 1974. Mm -hmm. And so uh, by this time he was established. Like I say, he's from the community. Um, so he did have a support of people, but also, of course, he had opposition. That's just kind of natural. Right. Not everybody was supporting him to be on the school board, or not everyone uh, was on board. But I think obviously the momentum happened. He won those elections, and that happened. He had to carry both the white vote and black vote. Mm -hmm. um, so that was pretty significant. Right. And uh, one thing about it, our home was always open to the community. We had um, different, like I said, we had parties. I mean, a party would just jump off when my parents would have people come over next to, you know, playing cards, yeah. music going, and stuff like that. So they was open. So it was informal parties and also um, also formal parties also. Yeah, and not just that, that people gather, they might have, you know, political strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, once my father was on the school board, a lot of the children, their parents came by, they had an issue and they knew they could go to my father and he can help, you know, with that. So in a way, our home was always uh, seen as like a gathering place, in right. a sense, for people who can come and also, you know, gather their thoughts and get knowledge and also um, uh, provide those uh, protections, if you will, if needed, to the community. It was sort of like a safe haven for some. From my point of view, uh, this area generally, we, we didn't have that much uh, racial tension because hey, we always went to school with white people. We didn't have that kind of issue where, uh, I mean, I'm beat up some white boys <laughs> and uh, get lynched. Oh, right, <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm uh, you know, So we didn't have that kind of uh, uh, a problem. Even though the riots did occur, but that was about a whole other thing out here, I think. You yes. know, more looting and, and that type of stuff than actual racial tension. During the 67 riots, actually, he heard threats of burning down the home. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just on the street, I don't, he didn't say specifically from who, but he and my grandfather, of course, they got their shotguns, and they literally guarded the <laughs> home during that time because you did have some outbreaks in the community. And at the time, and my parents told me, now everybody wasn't for that. You know, people told them, you guys can't do that. Mm -hmm. Young couple, black. You know, they were facing a lot of odds. And of course, in different parts of Detroit, black people couldn't live there then, you know, in a, you know, Palmer Woods, Sherry Forts. It started opening up a little later. But at that time, you know, a lot of, we still couldn't go to many places to live and build a home. You know, mm -hmm. white folks were still, you know, they were very inclusive. They had mob up on you if they have to. Mm -hmm. If you read the history of mobs of people building homes, of people before buying homes in different neighborhoods, and then the white mobs show up by the hundreds and thousands. One good thing about it, um, it's exclusive. Like white sides, the River Rouge and Ecors lived on one side of the tracks, and the blacks lived here. So in a way, it was kind of protected in a sense. I think if it was a threat from white people that there were so many black people who were in tune mm -hmm. that it would have been two mobs, you know, the white, I don't think they could have ran over that problem. As I mentioned before, it's unprecedented, you know, for you to be able to, God give you the vision to say, when you first called me and said, well, Kevin, I'm doing a documentary on my, on my dad's and I'm home. And I'm like, okay, well, that's good. It's famous to us. Mm -hmm. But then now when I get here, I can see, um, it's so much more than that. So, you know, praise God for you having that vision to where consecutive generations can have, I can talk about mm -hmm. something. Yes. I can explain something to you, but until you can see it, sometimes the impact even for children and grandchildren, whomever, 
sometimes you have to see it and um, visibly and you can hear it, you know, the impact, you know, so the, the, the wonderful thing is this will be huge in terms of the impact and I'm quite sure the foundation, you know, we always say that, you know, getting those old school values yes. and principles, now we can, it can carry on. The legacy that my parents left, um, it was definitely something that was it's a physical sense and also it was an asset to the community. Um, they were all recognized as people who were definitely a great influence in the community. They were also known to contribute to those things. Um, there was a legacy with the family. A lot of our family would come over and uh, like I said, we have the outdoor barbecues and other things. So it was one other, it was a way to I guess bring the community together in that sense. Dorothy, really, Joe, the Marks family, you know, that, that whole uh, uh, family has just been great, and I think what you're doing is, is, is a testament to it. I am just impressed. Um, I thank God for the legacy that um, our parents first instilled in us, and then what they left with the community, and I hope everyone um, who remembers them are proud of what they did for the community. I just always wanted to pay homage to my parents, uh, for that achievement of significance with building the home at the time. Uh, it was definitely something that was to look, look upon as something that's very um, significant or something to be admired. They were very humble people. So as I look around and take documents, there wasn't a lot of pictures or videos of while they were living there. They didn't brag or anything like that. So I just wanted to, as their child, is to pay homage and also just document it and talk about it and give my perspective. Um, as it was mentioned before, it was during the late 60s and during that time, it was just a lot of still racial strife and a lot of things. And this was even before the Fair Housing Act of 1968. So as far as getting loans for homes and things of that nature, it just wasn't readily available. And that's my mother and parent father also told me, just save, you have to really save your money. And now I understand what they're saying when it comes to home purchases, because you want to also not so much finance so much, but pay so much significantly off. So in the present or in the future, when you do have it, you're not uh, struggling to maintain a home. Now I understand and you know the impact of your mom and your dad, you know, not just you and your sister, but the impact on the community, politics, activism, uh, warmth, uh, a true village, and a lot of part of who I am, and a lot of us, I can talk to, I can bring, we can bring several guys in here and put a mic in their hand and say, hey, tell me a little bit about Mr. and Mr. Tucker, and I guarantee you, the first thing they will say is, it had, it had an impact on my life.